Hello, everybody that I can't see. Hello, hey, somebody's there. Uh, my name is Chris Hostetter, or Haas. This is me. Uh, this is Solar, which is what we're here to talk about today. I love this stage because I'm like right here, and I love to do this. Um, so my name is Haas. I work at Lucidworks. You are at Berlin Buzzwords. We're going to talk about Solar. This talk is called Hidden Gems. Um, what, the, what the point of this talk is, and why I sort of made this, is over the years, um, there are things about Solar that I know, and that people who are really experienced with solar usually know, um, but I'm really surprised. Every now and then I'll meet someone, I'm like, wait, you've used solar for like two years. Like, you didn't know that it had this feature? And that's where it's sort of, it's, it's the, you know, it's very cool little things. It's sort of a collection, a survey of interesting things that I've talked to people, and I've been like, you're, you know, new users, they don't know a lot of stuff. They read the docs, they learn about it, but there's features that we've had. These aren't most of these aren't new features. There's one or two new features. Most of these are features that have been around years, but not a lot of people know, seem to know about them. So I wanted to get out there and tell people more about them. Um, this talk is not really an intro to solar. Can I maybe see who here uses solar? Excellent. Okay, all of you put your hands down. Who here has never used solar? And please just be honest so that I know. Okay, well, you're out of luck. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, wait. One more. All right, there's two of you, so I will, I will attempt to give you quick explanations. But since we don't have a lot of time, I won't go into too much introductory stuff. Um, but I will frequently say who here has ever seen this before, because I want to know, because I don't want to waste time telling you stuff you guys already know. Okay? So we're going to start with an easy one, a quick little palette cleanser, monitoring, right? Um, this is the solar admin UI. Who here has never seen this screen before? One, two... I s All right, three, okay. So this is what you get if you go to solar in a web browser. This is sort of what you'll see. It's got a left nav. This is where you sort of can do things that are per collection. These are things that are global to the whole solar setup. And then here I've clicked down and I've said, tell me information about the plugins and statistics that I've got in my collection. And these are the categories of things. And what I wanted to show you here is there's a lot of statistics that solar is keeping track of and a lot of things that you can monitor. In this specific case, I'm looking at caches. I'm looking specifically at the filter cache. And I'm looking at some of my cache hit rates. I'm looking at how many evictions I've got. I've got information about the current instance of the cache, but also global things since solar started up. All of this is available in the UI, which is, makes it really handy for when you're doing development and you wanted to sanity check things. Who, who here has ever, it's hard to make out, but this is the watch changes refresh values. Has anyone ever used those? A couple people. What these do, these are these, are, these, are these really cool little just UI uh, pieces that uh, Stefan Mathis, uh, a German living in Zurich now, who's, who's really awesome and who did almost the entire solar UI. He, um, he added this, uh, and what this does is it's an easy way for you to say, these are my stats now. I'm going to click this button, and it's, it's all in the browser. There's nothing sophisticated about it. But I'm going to click this watch button, and then I'm going to go do some stuff. And then I'm going to come back and click the stopwatch button, and it's going to tell me what changed. And it's going to tell me that I got five more things put in my cache. And that's going to let me sanity check that the things that I thought were being cached aren't being cached because they got added. So apparently they weren't in there before. It's a, it's a handy little, uh, little tool. Not a lot of people know about this. It's not something that you probably use every day, but it's good to sort of have in your head. But at the larger picture, the fact that all these stats are available, um, sort of some people every now and then are like, I, I don't know. Well, they're there. Not only are they there, but they're all available via JMX, right? This is the, uh, this is the JMX console, J console, right? If, who here uses JMX ever? OK. Who here knew that you could get solar stats from JMX? That was less hands. Actually, that was different hands. Ironically, the people who use JMX had no idea, and the people who don't use JMX are like, of course you can. Anyway, if you use JMX, all of those stats are available. Anything you see in the admin UI uh, is readable via JMX. We don't, we don't really do... You can't use the, the JMX system to write a lot of information into solar, unfortunately. Um, but any of those stats can be monitored with JMX. So if you use Nagios or if you use Zabbix or any of those monitoring systems that can pull from a JMX source to you know, plot your time series information, uh, you, can, you can get all of that straight from Solar just by enabling uh, JMX. And if, I, I should have mentioned before, um, if you look at these slides online, it's all HTML. All of these slides have links where you can go read the documentation about these features so you can find out more about that. 
But all of the stuff that you see in the admin UI is available via JMX. And even if you don't use JMX, it's all available from a REST API. The admin UI is 100% JavaScript single page running on the solar port. And everything it gets is just by talking to the solar port and getting JSON back from APIs that look like this. So this is, again, this is that same cache stats info for the filter cache, cumulative rates, current rates, right? So all of that information is accessible to you. You can hook that into your existing monitoring systems, things like that. Does that make sense to everybody? If it doesn't make sense, raise your hand. If it makes sense, raise your hand. Yeah, all right, good. You're all awake. That's the important thing. Um, OK, so the next thing, totally changing topics, because that's the kind of talk this is. We're talking about lots of different little things. Facet method. Who here uses faceting in solar? Who here doesn't use faceting in solar? So four people haven't learned how awesome faceting is. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm learning here. OK, so who here has used facet method? Who here has configured this and changed this? One? Wait, wait, all the people who use faceting, raise your hands again. Wow, that is, that is I mean, that, I'm not surprised, but that's, usually I am surprised. Usually I'm like, oh, way more people know about it. What that tells me is we're doing a really good job because you guys use it and it just works and you're happy. Uh, we should talk later because I want to know why you had to mess with this because that saved me. Oh, because you saw, ah, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. So facet method controls the internal algorithm Solar uses to decide how to do your faceting. There's three different values. Two of them are very similar. They're called FC and FCS. This comes from the name field cache. One is field cache, and one is field cache per segment, which is a relatively, in the history of Solar and Lucene, a relatively newer concept. Um, they both fundamentally kind of do the same thing. They are iterating over the unique Hold on, let me get this right. No, they're iterating over the documents and maintaining counters for the unique values they see using the field cache. The difference is that the default, just FC, field cache, that's using a global field cache over the entire index. FCS is doing it per segment, right? Um, the, the sort of fundamental difference is that the global field cache uh, takes longer to build. Right? So every time you open a new searcher, it has to build up this data structure because your entire index, from its perspective, because it's global, has changed. When you do it per segment, you have less work you have to do. So in theory, this is a little faster in the near real-time case, where you're constantly updating documents and constantly reopening searchers. But there's an overhead to that. Right? It's, it's faster on the updates. It's faster to reopen the searchers. But it has more logic it has to do to merge those counts. Right? If you're faceting on category and it wants to know, well, what is the top category? Is animals the top category or sports the top category? It has to look at it per segment and then it has to accumulate all those counts. Whereas if it does it globally, it's got this sort of one setup operation to build this field cache and then it can just do a simple scan. Right? So that's why this is the default because even, even in real time cases, sometimes it's still faster depending on the volume of data you're dealing with. So, while this is the default and it works for a lot of people, it's definitely worth experimenting and changing it to FCS and seeing if that helps you out a little bit better. Um, more importantly, though, relatively recently in Lucina Solar is this concept called doc values. If you are faceting and you are not using doc values, you should totally go look in doc values. When you use doc values, this is still a choice you can make. Doc values are inherently per segment. Um, but what Solar will do if you are using the default option is it, it builds a structure sort of on top of them, right? That structure takes a little bit of time every time you open a searcher to build that, but then it's very fast every time you fast it. But you might find that for your data, for the volume of data you're dealing with, for the rate of updates you're dealing with, you would rather just use the doc values directly and pay that accumulation cost. It's something to experiment with. It's a performance-related tuning knob but it's worth trying out. I tried to write a blog post where I was like, here is the perfect example of when it is worthwhile to use per segment stuff. It was really hard. I was in my head, even knowing the code, I was like, here's an example of where this will be so much faster that I can just show it trivially in a blog post. And I couldn't do it. And then I tried again and I couldn't do it. And I was like, ah, you know what? I'm going to give up on this book because even I don't even understand it anymore. So there's a lot of theory as to when this is faster. But just try it. See. Use, use real data. Use real queries. See what happens. Okay? The third option, remember, we're talking about this is the parameter that you can change. These are the values. The third one is enum. Enum is a very historical, uh, old school. It was the original faceting method that we implemented in Solar back in 2000, 
2005, 2006, I don't remember. Um, instead of using the field cache, it actually iterates over the terms in your index and it builds a query and it executes that query and it counts the results and it, it, all of this can go in the filter cache, right? Who, who here knows what I mean when I said field cache versus filter cache? Ah, crap. Okay, so the field cache is what's used for sorting. I should probably should have mentioned that before. Field cache is what's used for sorting. It is basically an un, an uninverted index, right? It lets you do very fast lookups from documents to values, right? That's the field cache. It's per field. The filter cache is what happens when you filter results. So when you say, find me all products matching uh, iPhone made by a manufacturer, Apple, that's a scoring-based query. But then you could have put a filter on it. You could say, and price uh, less than $200. And those can be cached independently in this, uh, in this special cache that we call the filter cache. Right? So when you specify the enum option for faceting, it's going to leverage that same cache. And it's basically under the covers filtering, it's taking whatever your query was, and then you say, I want to facet on the category field. It's going to take your query, and under the covers, it's going to imagine that you have then filtered on every possible category, and it's going to find all those docs and give you back the facet counts. This was, like I say, this is the old, old version. It wasn't super efficient. That's why we came up with the FC and FCS methods. But it has two very powerful use cases, right? One is where the cardinality of your data is very small. Uh, Boolean fields, for example. If you have Booleans and you want to facet on them, we still use this method because there's only two sets, right? You, enumerating the two Boolean values and generating those queries is really quick. And if you ever filter on one of them, odds are you have a 50% chance of, that you'll reuse one of those filters. So there's no, I mean, it's like, we might as well, because most of the time when people want to facet on something, later they're going to go, okay, now I know what the top categories are, what the top values are in this field, now I want to filter on them. So it comes in very handy for this small cardinality use case. Boolean is an example. Uh, somebody I know, because of the volume of their data, they found that when they were faceting on uh, a state field in the US, we have, you know, there's 50 states, he had a state field in his data and he wanted to facet on that. Um, he found that this was faster for his data. The other end of the spectrum is when you have huge cardinality fields. People like to try and build tag clouds by faceting on full text, right? So they index the encyclopedias of the world, and then they want to build a tag cloud, and they discover that faceting rolls over and dies because there's too much RAM. You can use the enum method, and it will be slow because it's enumerating over every term, but it is possible. And there are options. This is called facet enum cache mindf. Mindf refers to the minimum doc frequency. This is a way of telling it while you're enumerating all over all of those terms, the ones that are like trivially minor and like appear in three docs, throw them away. Forget all about them. Don't bother to cache that. This is how big, this is how many documents that term must appear in for me to care enough for you to keep track of that. So it's a very slow way to facet over high cardinality terms that would never work if you tried to build the field cache on it. Does that make sense to folks? Cool. All right. Does anybody have any questions about that? We have a mic, and we can do questions at the end. But I always like to ask, because there's like 15 topics in this talk, so you're going to forget. If you have a question, just shout it out, and I'll repeat it for people. No? OK. So totally new topic. This is like lightning talks, but with one guy. I love it. Um, except that it's me, so I'm biased. Um, result clustering. Uh, did anybody go to the randomized text? Te uh, pause. Did anyone go to the randomized testing talk earlier today? Yes. OK. So the guy who gave that talk, David, uh, he works for a group called Carrot. Carrot does result clustering. This is an example of what result clustering is. It's kind of like. Um, the, the term people I've, I've seen used, I've, although I don't know I've ever seen David refer to it this way, is, uh, is dynamic faceting, right? The idea is you don't know what the fields are. You don't know what the features of your data are. Um, so you want it to just kind of figure it out. So this is an example using a, a Veroni diagram from their website, if you go to Carrot2. Um, if you search for something like law, what it does is it actually looks in the summaries of all the documents, and it finds common phrases and things, and it tries to figure out 
what the sort of categories might be. This is kind of a classic machine learning problem where you bulk process all of your data and you know you use a classifier system on it and it finds them and then you do text labeling all that. Um, but what the what the result clustering component in Solar is really good at is it does this on the fly with very small sets. The, the, the result clustering algorithm is sort of optimized for small sets. So instead of doing it over your corpus of a million documents, it does it over some configured number of the, the top matching results. So if in Solar you turn on the clustering component, in addition to your regular results, here's the top 10 matches, you'll get back some clustering information. It'll say, well, I found a cluster, and based on the, the field you configured me to look at and find words from, I found that the word environmental seemed to be an interesting word in the top results, and here are the five documents that I found that seem to be related to environmental. And then the next interesting result cluster that I found was these three documents with the words human rights. Okay, so in the, in the docs, you can find some information how to configure this. In the examples, you can find an easy way to sort of turn this on with the solar example data and the example configs. Um, and it will, you'll be able to sort of run this. And all of these labels are just coming from the body text that we've indexed, basically. Right? It's just sort of finding them and it's crunching the sort of, I think, it's, I think by default, it's the top 100 matches. And it's saying, where, what, what is interesting about this? It's not the sort of... Um, bulk processing result cluster. It's not the bulk. It's not the bulk processing uh, clustering algorithms that you might be used to if you come from a machine learning background. They're modified versions of those designed more for smaller sets and speed. Right? Has anyone ever used this in Solar? Yeah, that's why it's in. Oh, oh, awesome. This is why it's a hidden gem because even I forget this sometimes. People ask questions and I'll be trying to figure out how to solve their problem and like half an hour into it, I'll be like, oh, wait, duh. We have the clustering now. You know, we have the clustering contrib. Just turn this on. All right. So next topic, because I like to cram a lot of stuff in, and we're already halfway done. Um, function boosting and personalized scores. Okay. This is a quick example of what I mean by function boosting. Um, this is actually two examples. They're similar, but not exactly the same. The first one is what most people are probably used to seeing. This is a query for a couple words. Uh, I'm using the edismax parser. Can, can anyone read this? Actually, I'm sorry. All right. I just wanted to double check. Because I can read it, but I'm also two feet away. I don't know if you guys can read it. Um, but we're, we're doing a sort of simple query using the edismax parser, and then we're applying a boost. This is a, a sort of native feature of this parser that says, I want to find results that match these words. I want to have the scores involved in this match. I want my TF-IDF scoring and relevancy scoring to matter. But I want to augment that, because I know some stuff about my data. I know that I have a field called popularity, and the bigger that number is, the better. And I know I have a field called price, and the lower that number is, the better. So I'm going to multiply by popularity divided by price. Oh, wait, but price can be zero. So let's add one to it so I don't get a divide by zero error. This is going to give me a number that I can boost my results by. I'm not ignoring my score. Relevancy is still a factor here, but I am boosting by this function. It's going to multiply in. Okay? This is the same basic example, but where this uses a special boost parameter, which is a feature of the edismax parser, this is, uses an inline parser called, coincidentally, the boost query parser, which works very similar. It takes in a function. I'm passing it through a, a custom variable name that I've declared. I'm going to use the same function. But then my query comes from a, another custom query parameter. And I can use any parser I want here. Uh, this is the Lucene query parser by default, using the Lucene syntax with field names, and, and I've got a plus here, and I've, I'm using quotes. So boosting is a very general concept. You might be familiar with it from the edismax parser, but it's a very general thing that can be done. Any query can be wrapped in this boost query parser to apply some custom functions like that. Okay? If you go to my website two years ago when ApacheCon was in uh, Syntime, I gave a full hour talk on like boosting functions, um, which I think you might want to check out if this is interesting to you. Does this make sense to folks that you can multiply things into the score? Are there people here already doing this? If you're already doing this, raise your hand. Because you went to my other talk, didn't you? Oh, all right. I was going to. All right. But a couple other people are. Is anybody totally lost? No one else will see you but me, I promise. All right. Nobody's totally lost? That's fine. So this guy, Amit, who's uh, on the solar mailing list, he went to my talk in Sintime where I was talking about boosting functions. And I gave him a crazy example of something that I thought people should do. And I was like, this is awesome. I've never done this, but people should totally check it out. And he was walked out of that talk. And then a month later, he emailed me. He's like, hey, I've been doing that. It's really awesome. Like, can you sanity check something for me? What he's doing 
is he's using offline machine learning algorithms to crunch user preferences, right? I think, if I remember right, his use case is specifically movies, right? He works for a movie management site. Um, so it's like, imagine it's Netflix, but he doesn't work for Netflix. I never said he works for Netflix. You can't prove it. Um, he, no, he, he doesn't actually work. I don't remember where he works. I wish I did, but, um, but he crunches, uh, it's like shows, right? I went to this show. And then he looks at the metadata of that show and he tries to figure out, based on the shows you go to and the categories associated with those shows, what categories do you seem to like, right? This is a very classic kind of Mahout problem. You come up with vectors of, well, he seems to really like comedy and he seems to really like, what are my examples here? He likes comedy and he likes action, but he's never gone to a kid's movie. So compared to the average person, his preferences seem to be more towards action and comedy. He's got a positive score on action and comedy and a negative score on children's stuff, right? So he computes a Z-score, a normalized score for everybody across the entire data set. He puts that into a quick uh, key value lookup system. And then when a user comes to his site, he does that quick lookup and says, what are their three most significant scores, either positive or negative? What are the things they either like the most or hate the most? And then he plugs them into this custom query function, which says, take the score of my query using TF-IDF. If I don't know anything about the user, these numbers are just going to be zero and they're just going to drop out. But if I do, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have three categories that I can execute as queries and I'm going to have three uh, z-normalized um, preference values for each of those queries, which I can use as a power function on them, right? Uh, an exponential. So I'm going to say, well, how much did he like action movies uh, to the power of how much he liked it times how much he liked comedies to that exponent times how much he liked kids to the negative exponent, which means it's basically dividing by that. Multiply all that up by the score. So he's now got a very personalized custom scoring function that isn't ignoring relevancy. It isn't ignoring TF-IDF. And it works great, even if it's a totally random user. It, this just all drops out. It's just one. Um, but now he's got the ability to say, based on what you've seen, I know you're probably going to like these movies a little better. Right? Does that make sense to folks? It's really powerful, really easy. I mean, it's, like I say, it, he's like... The hardest part was he was like trying to debate, should I multiply or should I add? You know, it's like, just try it, find it. But plugging these functions in is really simple. Okay? All right. Totally new topic. Uh, um, depends. Uh, I'm doing this with depends. Those are two totally different words, and I just made them one word, which in America would be a really funny joke, but I don't think you guys have depends here. Um, defaults, appends, invariants, oh my. Um, a common complaint that I've heard about solar, which just makes me shake my head and go, really? Like, that's your complaint? Is that my URLs are really long. I have a query, and I have a query parser, and I have the fields I want, and my URLs are really long. Well, of course your URLs are really long, and of course this is hard to read, because you don't want to put all that in the query. Something that solar's had since the day, I'm pretty sure since the day we open sourced it, was the ability to say, in your configuration file, I want some defaults. Because 90 percent of what you see here never changes. In development, you might type this out or cut and paste it, and you might try it out, and you might play around with what boosts you want and what fields you want, and you might say, oh, I totally forgot. I also need to ask for the title field. But once you get that going, you're never going to change that again, right? You're never going to change this in production. So you have defaults. In your configuration file, you can say, when a query comes in, all I really need to know is the query string. All I really need to know is they're searching for Nightfall by Isaac Asimov. And all of this other crap just stays the same. It's a default. If they really want to change it, they can. But by default, they're going to ask for the first page. They're going to ask for 100 rows. We're going to filter by in stock. This is the fields I'm going to return to them. I'm going to sort by score. And then I'm going to have a secondary sort by price. None of that changes. You can default all of that. On top of that, though, is this concept of appending and invariant parameters. If we read up from the bottom, these are our defaults. Right? This is a section called defaults. We said we're going to default to page zero. These are our field list. But we're also going to have this appends. This is similar to a default. Right? I'm appending a filter query on the in stock field. It's similar to a default, but if they give me other filters, if they say filter by the action category or filter by mysteries, they're still also going to get this filter for in stock. This is handy as sort of like a, a, a sanity check on your data. You might be indexing all of your data because tools query it. But when your front end queries it, you always only want them to know what do I actually have in stock? What's actually for sale? Okay, So you want that to apply in addition to the stuff they tell you. 
This third section here is called invariance. These are things that no matter what can't be changed, right? In this case, they can override it. In this case, they can append to it. But in this case, nothing they can do can change this. They're always going to get only 100 docs per page, right? They're always going to get sorted by score. We're always going to boost by these functions. They're always going to get the EDIS max parser. These are invariants that you're enforcing on all of your clients. You don't have to force them on all of your clients, though, because this is still per handler. Here is our select handler. You can have 50 handlers configured if you want. You can say, for this client, I'm going to create a custom handler. I'm going to tell them, you query with this URL. You've got all of that configured. Later, you can change that out from under them if you want. If you decide that your front end should query slash front end, you declare a handler named slash front end. You configure its defaults. You configure its invariants. And then later, you can say, ah, you know what? The front end does need to see products that aren't in stock. So I need to remove that filter. But your clients never have to know. You don't have to tell them, go change all your queries, right? Um, a lot of implementation details can be hidden there. I'm not going to go through this example in depth. It's, it's Like I say, you can look at the slides a little later. This uses something called the switch query parser, which basically um, it's, it's a way of doing case statements in a query parser, right? So I've got a very simple URL where I say I'm going to have a parameter called shipping and a parameter called cat. These are not normal solar parameters. Solar would never normally know what to do with them. But here, without writing any code, I've just configured some very basic logic that says, you know, I've got two different values that might be specified for shipping, free to members, or uh, what was the other one? Free or free to members are my two options. And depending on which I get, I'll have a completely different filter query. And if I get neither of those, I won't filter by anything. I'll just match all docs. And likewise, on category, if I get a name of a category, I will filter on that in my category field. If I don't get that parameter, I won't filter on anything. This is something that's very simple to do, and it hides that implementation detail that your, your clients never have to know how you're doing that under the covers. Yeah, we have a question. Go ahead. He's asking, is this a form of implementing your own query parser? It's not just about the query parsing as much as it is about the configuration of things that might not be within a query parsing. Right? The context of a query parser is either like the queue parameter, the scoring part of the query, or the filtering part of the query. The appends and defaults and invariants, they can be applied to any parameters, whether they're used by the parser or whether they're used by the sorting, you know, things like that. In the context specifically of this switch example, yes, you could write a custom query parser that does your special logic that says, I know a word I'm going to expect. And based on that, I'm going to generate some complex query. And you could write that in Java code, absolutely. That's kind of what I did with the switch parser. I just implemented it in a way that it's very simple in a case statement, so that you don't have to go write five lines of Java just for these kinds of examples. But you certainly could to replace that. OK? Um, the, the big takeaway here is this switch parser in particular is not going to solve all your problems. I mean, that's what I say. You can always go do more custom solutions. You can always go add your own REST proxy API in front of Solar that implements all sorts of business logic if you want. But for 80% of the use cases I've seen, you can handle it through these handler configurations or through things like the switch parser. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, cool. So um, speaking of the query parsers and things that you can do with query parsers, um, I talked about the Lucene parser. I talked about the EDIS max parser. We just saw an example of the switch query parser. I also mentioned the boost parser before. Um, most people know these three, Lucene, DISMAX, and EDIS max. Um, Lucene has the sort of canonical syntax people are used to with the plus and the minus and the ands and the ors and the quotes. Uh, you know, put parentheses around things to nest Booleans. Um, DISMAX was a sort of simplified version of that that we came up with that I came up with and unfortunately unleashed on the world, this sort of convolutes two ideas of building disjunction max queries, which is a very complex topic that I don't have time to get into what that exactly means. But it sort of convoluted building disjunctions over a simplified syntax. It tries to be smart and not allow you to do complex things like nesting parentheses. Um, EDIS max sort of tries to bridge the best of both worlds. EDIS max says, you can configure me like the DISMAX parser, you can configure me to be a simplified syntax. But if I see the full advanced syntax of Lucene, I'm going to do my best to make that work. Um, it doesn't always, but it tries. These are the parsers most Solar users know about. Uh, trying to figure out how to word this question. Who here has used one? Who here has used two of these parsers before? OK, who has only used one of these parsers before? 
Wow, all right. Well, more people raised their hands that they were using solar than raised their hands that they were using one of these parsers, which means you're all either getting very tired or you're using solar in ways I have never seen before because somehow you are not using a query, one of these query parsers. But anyway, these are the ones people tend to know about. There's actually 10 more of them that people usually have never heard of, right? So um, these are the full list of parsers that are in solar. I I'm not going to try and go into all of them. The... <laughs> There are five of them that are bolded, if you can believe that, and clearly I should have used a different color. We talked a little bit about the boost one before, um, but there's also this simple parser, which is really recently added, which sort of tries to uh, solve the best of both worlds of what eDismax does, but doesn't add all the disjunction gunk. Um, the field parser and the term parser are very handy for when you don't want syntax at all. You know you want to query a single field, and you just want its analyzer to be used, right? They're, they're, they're worth looking into. The field one says, I have a blob of text queried in this field, whatever its analyzer is. Just make it work. If it needs to be a phrase, make it a phrase. If it needs to be a term, make it a term. The term parser says, I know this specific term is in my field. I want it to work, even if it has white spaces. Treat it as one term. The term parser, if you're using faceting, is almost always what you want to be using when you filter. Okay, so definitely go look at that. And then last, uh, the f range parser is a very handy little parser which says, I'm going to generate a function, right? We looked at boost functions before. I'm going to generate a function, and I want you to filter on ranges of those functions, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a function which computes some sort of personalized metric, and I want to filter on only things where the values are between 0 and 100, right? The, the use cases for them are honestly endless, um, but a lot of, not a lot of people know about them. And if nothing else, go look into these five parsers and think to yourself, would these be handy to me? There's links to all this stuff uh, in, the, in the slides. Yeah. Uh, OK. Okay, so her question, her question was, yeah, yeah, okay, so her question was she's using eDismax right now, and she'd like to wrap it in the boost parser, but she's having trouble in finding that some of the features of the eDismax don't seem to work when it's wrapped there. Um, time check. Talk to me afterwards, because I want to talk through that, because it should work fine. There are definitely, the syntax definitely has its quirks. I'm not going to, you know, blow smoke up your ass and tell you it's perfect. It's not. It's ugly. It grew organically over time. Um, it should definitely be possible to make that all work. Um, it just may not be easy. <laughs> but it should be, so, which makes me think maybe there's some sort of simple, obvious little mistake there. So we can look at that. All right, I'm going to go really quick. Hierarchical documents, um, uh, also known as block join. This is a relatively new feature of Solar. Um, you can basically think of it as saying, you know, in, in a classical hierarchical document uh, use case is, I'm going to index books. And books consist of sections, and sections consist of chapters, and chapters consist of pages. And I want to be able to do queries to say, find me books where there is a section that contains a page which mentions Isaac Asimov, and somewhere in that same section, Robert Silverberg is mentioned. That's the kind of example of hierarchical documents that you can sort of search for. In this example, I've said I've got a document which represents an album, which is the Wayne's World soundtrack. And in that soundtrack are many documents that represent songs. And each of those songs has a name and an artist. Okay? You can index this right now. This is the XML example of indexing in Solar. You can do it in JSON. You can do it using the Java API. You can index these kinds of documents. And all of the normal things you do with documents, the normal types of queries you expect, those still work. You can still say, okay, go search for documents that contain soundtrack. And I can filter by, you know, this is just a... Uh, I've added a field here just for my own convenience called doc type. So album versus song versus song. You can still go say, find me everything that matches soundtrack filtered by albums. Or find me everything that matches love filtered by songs. You can go do those. Those are still normal documents like anything else. But you can also do more interesting things where you're querying on the relationships. You can say, find me documents matching love, which are children of things that have doc type album which match soundtrack, right? So this is only love songs on soundtracks. Or you can say, find me soundtracks, which are parents of documents containing love. The only thing that gets tricky here is you still, in our example, we only have one type of parent and one type of child, albums and songs. 
But think back to that other example. You could have many levels of this hierarchy. You have to say which type of parent you want to be, right? I'm, I'm not just saying I want to find soundtracks which are songs which might be a parent of something else. I'm saying I want to find soundtracks which are albums, and those are parents of something which matches love. This is all pretty straightforward. It's, it's very simple. It works very elegantly. Um, the more complicated types of queries, find me soundtracks which are a parent of songs that are by Alice Cooper, but on that same soundtrack, I must also find a song which is got, it's a love song written by Soundgarden, okay? So I'm finding the album. The album criteria is that it must contain one or more songs which match two different criteria. And it's gotta be the same one. This won't work if Alice Cooper wrote a love song and it's on an album which also contains Soundgarden, it won't work. You must find at least one which is Soundgarden and love and it must be in the same album as something by Alice Cooper, right? Complex relationships are really easy to express here. There are a lot of caveats to using block joins because it is relatively new. I won't go into all the details, but definitely some issues with uh, how some of the relationships are managed when you start deleting things. Delete by ID in particular kind of goes nuts with this sort of situation because it doesn't understand the children. Um, and there's, uh, you know, some of these things are actually really simple and they're probably going to be in 4.9. Um, but it's definitely there. Um, and then the last thing, because I am totally out of time, is update processors. Uh, update processors are not well documented, but they're a way to say when a document gets added or updated in my index, uh, or when a commit happens, I want certain logic to be applied. There's a nice toolkit of very simple ones. So here's an example where we've said, if I'm doing books, and books have authors and editors, I want to synthetically create a field called contributors which is the list of all the authors and the editors. But I also want to create a field called primary author, which is whoever appears first in my author field, right? No code, just some simple configuration of these sort of out of the box little bits, but it lets you do lots of field manipulations. If you want to write code, there's even one that says, okay, well, give me a list of some JavaScript, and in that JavaScript, tell me what you want to do. Have whatever branching conditionals you want. You have full access to the input document. You can manipulate it any way you want, and when you're done, We'll go add it to the index. Okay? Um, that's all I've got. So we've got time for questions. We've got one hand up. Um, just, you know what, just shout it out so that he doesn't have to run over there, and I'll repeat it. So his question was, he's doing something very similar to this example, but he's doing it through a Java implementation. Um, your Java implementation is going to be faster than the script implementation. Like, you don't need to like say, oh, I'm going to stop. Um, the Java API for the update processor is very simple, and it's not likely to change anytime soon. So you're upgrading. Your upgrading is going to be harder with a JavaScript one than it will ever be with Java, because if the, up if the API changes, your Java will be a compile time problem. <laughs> your JavaScript will be a runtime problem. Um, so your Java, if you've already written the Java, you're fine. If you're a Ruby guy and you don't ever want to touch Java, you can write this in Ruby, right? JavaScript is just the default example here, but there's a way to say like, hey, Java, anything that, anything that has an implementation that can run in the JVM as a, as a they call it a script engine. Uh, I've seen examples with Python, JavaScript, Ruby, et cetera. Any of that stuff that you can write, if you want to write some of these scripts, Solar can load it. Okay? Um, and fortunately, we're out of time, right? We're totally out of time? Yeah, we're I, out of time. I, I think we have time for one more question. One more? One more yes, question. But I need to run with Mike. Oh, he really just wants to exercise. Okay. All yeah. right, run, run, run. One, I could have answered the question two, by now. Three, four, five. <laughs> Again. Um, we are using Solar currently, and we have already the discussion to use Elasticsearch or Solar, blah, 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 blah. Um, the main technology is Lucene, and I'm currently thinking about um, what is the right choice because main, uh, many of the um, Lucene developers are working at Elasticsearch but are contributing to Lucene and to Solar, and this is some kind of interesting. What would you think? Um, what's the best direction to go to Solar or Elasticsearch? Um. I mean, I'm on this stage, right? I'm not, I'm not on another stage giving a talk on hidden gems of Elasticsearch. So I think that gives you the, you're, I mean, I'm just, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but you're, the end of your question was, what do you think? And I'm like, well, 
I mean, it seems kind of obvious what I think. Um, what should you use is a much harder question because I want to be honest. And to be honest, I have to tell you, I'm biased. I'm not going to give you an impartial answer to that question. Um, I am not an Elasticsearch expert, so I can't tell you, like, these are the reasons why you should go use Elasticsearch. Um, I can tell you that for me, in 15 seconds, which is not enough time to answer this question, uh, for me, I fundamentally believe in the Apache Software Foundation. Um, I think that it, as a nonprofit entity that has been around for like 15 years, is never going anywhere. Um, I think that the code province and the ownership of the code and the existence of that foundation as the ownership, my company could burn into a fireball tomorrow and solar is still going to be around. The community of solar is still going to be around. Everything about solar is still going to be there. Um, that as a user is very important to me. I have seen what happened to things like MySQL. I have seen what happened to things like Red Hat. I have seen even, unfortunately, even, this is even with Apache, but it sort of came into Apache and then came out of it, the, the CouchDB fiasco. Um, you know, that like, I don't understand what happened there, but at the end of the day, CouchDB is still there, right? It's still at Apache. No matter what happened to anybody else and no matter what weird companies forked off of what weird companies, um, it's still there. But, you know, I look at, you know, I, when, I, when I used to work with MySQL and a lot, and I don't really anymore, but when that all happened, it was like, oh, shit, like, how does this affect me? Like, how does this affect my company? How does this affect our access to the next version if the next version is going to be a totally different license than the last version? Um, as a user, I know that's not going to happen, right? Um, as an employee of Lucidworks, I can't tell you what Lucidworks is going to do tomorrow, um, but I can tell you that the Apache Software Foundation is still going to be here. So that, to me, is more important than any of the sort of technical limitations. As a novice of Elasticsearch, I haven't seen anything. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's sexy. Like, it looks sexy. The API looks sexy. But I haven't seen anything where I'm like, that'll never work in solar. You know, I haven't seen anything where I'm like, we could never implement that. What I've usually seen is stuff like, oh, yeah, like, we sort of do the same thing, but we made different choices, and we did it, or, you know, ours evolved over five years, and this was built from scratch, and so ours has cruft that they don't, because, you know, like, shit like that, but at the end of the day, that doesn't work me up, right? It's not like, oh, we got to go rewrite from scratch so that we match this API. No, I'm not. But what makes sense to you, I can't tell you. Preference? Preference. Yes. Oh, don't, don't, don't even get me started on the whole like convention over yeah. code. I'm not even going to remotely. I like configuration myself. I, I, that's a dirty word to say, but I do. And we have to go, unfortunately. Sorry. I'm not yeah, going to let if, him cut me off. If there is any need for religious war, please, outside of this room. Unfortunately, we need to prepare this yep. stage uh, for next speaker. Thank you very much.